So welcome uh, participants to Model Sex on the online course, Migration Policy, Free Movement, and Regional Integration within the context of COVID-19, and then the AFC FTA. So this model is on the impact of COVID-19 on migration. So we'll start by looking at the reports that the UN Secretary General made with regarding uh, COVID-19. And this uh, saying that it's made that no one is safe until everyone is safe, which is a very profound um, statement regarding the impact of COVID-19 and the measures being put in place to deal with this pandemic. And that is where this model comes in. So this model focuses on COVID-19, the pandemic itself, the measures that have been put in place to deal with the spread and how these measures could impact on migration, migration in general, and then the different migrants and people who are on, in motion, mobile, different mobile groups. So as we all know, Africa as a continent is one of the continents that has the least experience of the pandemic in terms of the spread and then the impact that the COVID-19 has on the continent. And this is often against the popular notion that since Africa is one of the poor and impoverished continents, the COVID-19 pandemic would have hit us harder than any other um, continent. But evidence proved that since it started in March up to November 2020, the number of death, death has not been that much compared to other countries like Europe, the US, and then the Americas in general. And this has been as a result of the measures that the continent took, the various countries took in terms of curbing this measures. So we know that this, the continents and the states have acted promptly and organized a number of response measures, including the closure of borders, restriction of movements, and even to the extent of declaring states of emergence that led to the freeze of most socioeconomic activities I mean, also to in position of curfew, which restricted movement within and then outside the continent. All these measures were geared towards the prevention of the spread of the virus. Also, a lot of other measures have also put, that have also been put in place include medical services, social programs, in the way of finding safety nets for the population, especially the vulnerable population, to mitigate the economic vulnerabilities. So even though the COVID-19, which is one of the measures came later, the earliest measures was uh, the earliest measures were to provide social services that involved providing temporary accommodation, food, health care and other services. And to top with that, the, when the vaccine started, the continent made efforts to get uh, the vaccine for its um, citizens to ensure that they are also safe from the COVID-19. So these measures had their own devastating effects on national and international economies, lives and livelihood as well. And but the most impact has been on the marginalized population because they are the ones that have been affected the most. So marginalized populations such as migrants, refugees, asylum seekers have been disproportionately affected and have suffered most of the negative impact in terms of their wealth and the well-being in general. And this is as a result of the different characteristics that this migrants have. So based on the migrants, 
demographic characteristics also determines how the pandemic will impact on such a person. So migrants, refugees, asylum seekers who often face specific risks before, during, and after their journey saw this, their risk even exacerbated during the pandemic through the exposure of their precarious employment situation, their regular, irregular status, or difficulties in accessing health. And as I stated earlier, this, even though migrants may be vulnerable, but their specific demographic characteristics will determine the level of vulnerability that they may face. So, for example, if you compare a regular migrant and an irregular migrant, the regular migrant's vulnerability may be lesser than an irregular migrant. And this may also be associated with their employment. Because a regular migrant may have better employment with better salary that he or she can use to access healthcare. A regular migrant have access to public health care, um, access to public health care, which the irregular migrants may not have. And this all impact on their vulnerability. And since the irregular migrant doesn't um, have the resources to seek for even to enjoy free health care, he has to seek private health care, which is expensive. And the lack of resources, it's a limitation to the access of healthcare in this um, situation. So there are other factors that will also such as language, which goes to affect because when information is given in a language that the person doesn't understand, you don't even know what to access, where to access um, services and other things which make them more vulnerable. Again, if you also compare in terms of sex and age, so women tend to be more vulnerable to the pandemic than men. Children and adult children also be more vulnerable than adults. So these are the different um, variables that come to play to determine the level of vulnerability and then the impact that COVID-19 will have on migrants. So it can be said that for migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, the COVID-19 pandemic was and is still a health crisis. It is a socioeconomic crisis as well as a protection crisis. So these are the areas that they face um, challenges in terms of health, because the COVID-19, the pandemic itself is a health issue. And as it be a health issue, it has also, it also has impact on their socioeconomic activities because of the restrictions that have been put in place. Aside that, there are also issues of protection because they are vulnerable and they are available for any impact, any adverse impact, any attack, any discriminatory activities, xenophobic attacks, or available that could also uh, impact on them. So in terms of considering the health, the pandemic as a health crisis, consider the most vulnerable groups that are the focus of our attention in this model, who are migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, uh, asylum seekers experience very limited access to health services. As I explained earlier, this could be due to their legal status, whether they are regular or irregular migrants, or if you use the legal term, legal or illegal migrants. But as it is often advised that migration is not a crime. So we don't consider a migrant who has migrated as an illegal migrant. There could also be issues of language. So especially in, it's, there are common examples in North Africa where migrants were more vulnerable because they were not fluent or could not speak the Arabic language. When, so when there's any information that to spread around, migrants who don't speak the Arabic language find themselves wanting because they don't have access to the information and they're very limited. There are also cultural issues. And these cultural issues are people who don't belong. They don't, there's some differences in beliefs so all this also contribute to neglect and other um, barriers that also affect their access to health services. So they generally were more exposed to the virus than the general population. 
due to their the living conditions that they find themselves in, and then the lack of access to other services. Because at that, at that time, services also became very scarce. So it's like water, sanitation, nutrition were issues that they were battling with. So the few social services available targeted more of nationals than migrants, because for every country, the focus would be to attend to the needs of their nationals first, because those are the people that they have constitutional responsibility. So migrants find themselves wanting in this situation. So people seeking to also flee conflict um, situations in countries where there were conflict also face higher risk due to the weak health systems coupled with the travel restrictions that impeded the delivery of vital human humanitarian assistance. So all this contribute to impact on their health situation. In terms of their socioeconomic, um, as a socioeconomic crisis, it's also have been affected in terms of their jobs, which is their major source of livelihood. So those who especially work in the informal sector who depend on daily assistance. So they need to work daily or weekly in order to get income to survive. So with the restrictions and they not being able to work, uh, their socioeconomic well-being is something that has been affected. So they have limited access to, to social protection as a result of the measures put in place. And this exposed them to a lot of violence, sexual abuse, and exploitation. Critical examples can be made of domestic workers who find themselves in the Gulf regions. Because most of them were domestic workers and there's the need for social distancing as one of the measures to contain the spread of COVID-19. So some of the employers have to push them out of their homes because there's not enough space to practice the social distancing whilst they are there. So some will be laid off their work, their place of um, abode will also deny them. So they have to be on the streets and were exposed to all this violence, sexual abuse and exploitation. Some even lost their little savings that they had or they could not save it in banks over with them. They are they all spread and taken away. It's also led to huge losses of jobs, as I mentioned, wages. All this affected, and in turn also affected those who have also not migrated because the non-migrant family members depend on the migrants for their sustenance and they also depend on remittances. So this also affected the, the center of remittance because they are not working. They are also they also find themselves in difficult situations. And they, are, they don't even have enough to depend on, not to even talk of remitting back home. And then with issues of um, protection, as the border closure and then travel restrictions to keep the spread of COVID-19 also impacted on the rights of the migrants and refugees. And this also has, has exacerbated issues of xenophobia, racism, and stigmatization. Because they wish that they could also Go, in, go to their homes, but the borders were closed. They find themselves in all these situations which impacted on their vulnerable situation. So in the midst of all this, their vulnerable situations, there were laws that were also meant to provide protection for these vulnerable groups as migrants, um, asylum seekers, and refugees. So there are several international, continental, regional, and even national laws or treaties and other treaties that are meant to protect migrants. So in this case, we can talk of nine treaties adopted under the United Nations. So the CEDR and the other the international conventions on the right of migrants. We can talk of the, the maritime convention laws laws relating to children, laws relating to women, the SIDA, for example. So these are all international um, treaties that are there meant to protect the, the migrants. Even though they are migrants, they've not lost their fundamental human rights. All this, their rights are intact, and these laws are meant to protect them. 
In the same way, if you come to the African continent, you had the protocol on the right of women in Africa, which is supposed to protect women because in terms of vulnerability, women tend to be more vulnerable. So the most vulnerable group of people that we can find are women and then children. So these laws were there to also protect them. Then there are also protocols on the rights of persons with disability in Africa. So these laws are there to also protect people with disability. So if someone is a migrant, there's already vulnerability. If you are disabled, the vulnerability is aggravated. If you are a woman, it's even more. So these laws are there to also protect them. In the midst of free movement of persons, and the, the, the protocols on free movement, these all laws are there because the person, even though the person is a migrant, if there are conventions or agreements, especially as we have in Africa, the ECOWAS, the East African Community, SADC, IGAD, these are all um, regional agreements that um, even that has introduced or are working on introducing free movement of persons. And if anyone finds himself in a member country, that person is a citizen of the region and is subject to the protection of the country in which he finds himself. So aside all this, the African Convention, the international treaties are all supposed to protect such a person. And then in the area of labor law, there are the ILO constitution, which is also meant to protect all migrant workers. And we have most of my migrants being economic migrants, means so they migrated to work, and these laws are there to protect them. So, in terms of their health rights, they also have health rights as well. So, look at the World Health Organization Constitution, so talk about their rights of all people, including migrants, no matter where they are found, and they are not supposed to be discriminated on under any um, circumstance, whether by race, by gender, even their status of migration, whether they are legal or illegal migrants, they are entitled to this protection. And if you read the, the preamble of the World Health Organization Constitution, it states that human rights is a fundamental right for everyone. So as, so as a result, nobody should be denied the right to health or sick health services. Under no circumstance should someone be denied such a, a right. So the World Health Organization also the Global Plan of Action, which also aims to protect the health of refugees and migrants because of the COVID-19. As a result of COVID-19, I show sure that there's a need to also have equity at this point is also crucial because of COVID-19. So it affects everyone as the UN Secretary General says, and so everyone is safe, no one is safe. Also in terms of distribution of health services, protection of um, the, the, uh, everyone in terms of getting infected with the virus and any other service that is required is supposed to be equitably distributed. So whoever needs it more needs to get it. Whoever doesn't need have a that has protection should also do with what we have. And it's also considered that there are also vulnerable populations. And this, this distribution may be disproportionately affected. And there are also pre-existing vulnerabilities that could be exacerbated. So the Global Plan of Action for the World Health Organization considered all this. Among other things, also considered that refugees and migrants are more vulnerable to infections and death due to lack of financial protection. They are, they are mostly find, they also find themselves in crowded situations. And then the, the informal nature in which they find themselves are all potentially, they find themselves in potentially um, dangerous um, employment because the informal sector is among the least regulated um, sectors of economy in most countries. So these are the areas where we find more migrants in these vulnerable situations. Refugees and migrants who have limited access to healthcare because of their status. Most of them, if they find themselves in camps, it will be difficult for them to go into the main um, communities to access healthcare. 
And depending on the situation that they find, whether they are regular or irregular, these are all issues that impact them. Then in relation to international and regional refugee laws, we have the Refugee Convention and then the Refugee Status uh, Protocol. These are all laws that protect them at the international level. And the African level to the OAU refugee, Refugees in African Convention, so also there so to protect migrants and ensure that the situation that they find is as a result of the pandemic does not impact on them. Then there's also the Transnational Organized Crime Convention, which is called to prevent and suppress and punish trafficking in persons. But the COVID-19 also heightened the situation of human trafficking and smuggling because of the closure of the borders, people needed to move. And as a result, they fell victim to trafficking and smuggling. The most affected people are women and children. So there are also laws or conventions that deal with all this and ensure that they protect them. And in the spaces, in which spaces are they smuggled? By land, by sea, by air. So there are also laws that deal that are against smuggling either by land, by sea, or by air. There's also the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And this is also a global agreement by a number of countries that have agreed to ensure that um, they collaborate at the national, at the regional and the international level to ensure that migration is it is, it is, it is migration is conducted with less um, impact on the migrants in the country of origin and the country of destination as well. So member countries have agreed to ensure that they put in the right measures and structures to ensure that if migration has to be done, it has to be safe, it has to be orderly, it has to be regular to protect the vulnerabilities of migrants, to ensure that migration is done under less uh, vulnerable situations. So if you look at the paragraph five of the Convention on Objectives, five, six, and seven, they are all focusing on issues of vulnerability, ensure that member states put in the structures to reduce vulnerability of migrants, provide migrants with the needed resources, and then the information that will make them migrate safely so that they don't find themselves in a vulnerable situation. And then their rights, their rights are also issues that need to be protected. They talk about rights and ensure that they are protected. They are not attacked under any circumstances. Furthermore, there are also the other laws in terms of health, laws that regulate the international health sector. So in the international health regulations, which, is, which was adopted in 2005 by 126 states, and this includes most African states, so to provide comprehensive legal definition of the rights and obligation of that states have in the management of health emergencies. A typical example is COVID-19. And most of the time, global health emergencies tends to be transborder, so that cross international boundaries, which makes it more difficult and there's the need to also manage. So either to this, we had Ebola, which was also in part, and COVID-19 also came. So this regulation is to ensure that measures are put in place in member states uh, by, by their rights and obligations to ensure that they manage cross-border issues in terms of health cases. So if people need to cross their border, they know that what measures can be put in place to ensure that diseases don't spread across the borders. So its main purpose is to provide public health response to the cross-border um, spread of diseases, and also to ensure in ways that are proportionate and limited to public health risk. So to protect human rights as well, which is very key, protect the right of migrants. So it doesn't mean that in terms of pandemic situation, the rights of migrants should be abused. So they are supposed to also be protected. So in the international health regulations, it identifies the main measures to be impl implemented at the entry and exit port um, destination of most countries. So in every country we there, enter or exit to um, seaports, airports, 
and then land borders. So crossing into it to a measure should employ that with the, the limit is spread and then the associated hazards that come with it. So some of these measures also include vaccination uh, and other preventive measures to deal with all this situation. So the COVID-19 response has also offered, say, the opportunity to limit the movement of people across borders based on the international health regulations as they apply. So even though this may limit some rights, but it is in order that it is also supposed to protect the right of uh, the majority. But in terms of the restrictions, it's meant to ensure that others are also not infected. So cross-border movement may have continued while being pushed into more dangerous situations. So as I explained earlier, earlier this um, impact also, this um, measures that put in place impact um, irregular migration. So we have people who cannot now move out or move in using the right um, entry and exit channels now adopting the illegal routes. And if you look at the continent of Africa, even though we have um, well demarcated borders, the informal routes that we use to cross international borders are very rampant and then controlling them is also a situation. So the closure of the borders and then there was an increase in irregular um, crossings across international borders that also have important implication on the, the health issue there. It also undermined the effort being made to control the spread of the pandemic. So what measures were put in place to deal with the pandemic? So we talk earlier, earlier on, we talked about the entry restrictions, ban on entry of foreigners from certain countries, and then the total closure of borders. Then others, other countries also have some entry conditions that you need to fulfill in order to be admitted into their country. And some of these include requirements for testing, PCR tests, and other types of tests, mandatory quarantine. If you enter into your class, some countries will require that you are quarantined for two weeks, which was mostly the agreed period for the incubation of the, the virus. So after two weeks, to ensure that if you are, don't show any sign or after another test, you are declared negative, then you are allowed to move. If not the case, you are treated. Others also need to also present uh, medical forms or a medical examination before they are allowed to enter or exit the country. So states eventually shifted from border closure to entry requirements or to medical screening based on careful evidence-based risk assessment. So started with the stringent measures, then gradually started easing restrictions in order to ensure that the measures do not have greater impact on the general population as well as the vulnerable group, migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers. So in terms of migration policy with regards to foreigners, there are also other measures. So for example, migrants who were trapped in their countries of destination are not able to move back to their origin because of the closure of the borders had to be given extension of visas. Residents and work permits need to be extended for them to stay so that they do not become irregular and then be subjected to um, some attack because of their vulnerable situation. So you can talk of countries that adopted these measures, Angola, Botswana, Mauritius, Gabon, Mozambique, Nigeria, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. These were some of the measures that these countries adopted to mitigate the plight of migrants who have been trapped by the measures in countries of destination. Some of the measures also include the facilitation of access to labor markets. So especially in the area of recruitment of health workers and then recognition of um, foreign diplomats. Because at the time of the situation, health 
workers were the most sought after um, group of workers because it's the health issue, the assistance were being needed. So countries that needed such people have to lower some of their measures to facilitate the labor market entry of this um, group of people so that they could also support in the management of the pandemic. And also for foreign um, diplomats, they're also given some consideration to live in their country of work. Then there also um, another measure also deal with the regularization of undocumented workers. So workers who do not have the right documents to stay and work in countries of destination are given the opportunity to regularize their work and then stay as well. And then the pandemic also calls for the need to also ensure social distancing. So those who were in detention centers or detention camps, you know, most of those people are crowded and it is easier for the virus to spread in such situations. So amnesty granted to them for their release as well. And then suspension of forced returns. So um, migrants, irregular migrants who have been prepared for repatriation or return to their country of origin also have been suspended because borders were closed. So all these measures were put in place. And so then policies for um, migrants access to food, livelihood, and health. These are very important um, services that the migrants needed at the time. So healthcare, healthcare coverage and accessibility of health services. So the measures were put in place to ensure that healthcare were more accessible and then also covered this group of vulnerable people, widen the scope so that they could up. And there are also communication policies to also ensure that facilities that are available to provide access to the people, the information is given out for those who need it also have access. Remember, language was one of the barriers. So measures also put in place that they could <clears throat> adopt different modes or mediums of reaching out to people who may have language barrier or any other forms of um, that limit them from having access to information about COVID-19 and how to access healthcare. So even those in camps and other similar environment, the, the coverage was also widened to reach out to them. Then they, they also include the situation of migrant workers who also found themselves in vulnerable situation measures with it. So all the services reach out to them. Access to COVID-19 vaccine was also very important. So aside the social services, COVID-19 was also, a vaccine was also very important for them to be able to access. Then access to food and livelihood. So all these were important measures that were put in place to ensure that it mitigates the vulnerability situation of um, migrants, refugees, and then our asylum seekers. Thank you very much. This will be the end of module six for this course. Thank you and all the best in the course.